Hi, good morning, everyone. As most of you know, my name is Mary Ann Barthel, and I have the good fortune to be the director of the arts program here at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Thank you for coming in on this cold morning. Uh, happy March 1st. Spring is this month. Yay! <laughs> Um, I'm so pleased to have Liz Hawks de Nord here today as our artist who is doing our artist talk for, Ma uh, for March. She has an exhibit upstairs uh, in the fifth floor rotunda gallery space through the end of March here. It's absolutely stunning, colorful, beautiful work. Uh, I know she has slides, but uh, you should really see it in person. So if you can't do that after the talk, please come back sometime before the end of March. Liz comes to us from Saxton's River, uh, Vermont. Westminster West. Which Westminster is next door West. To Saxton's River. Yep. Yes, it's um, yep. it's all those little it's tiny those communities. Little towns, right? Yeah, uh, and we're so pleased to have her here, and really appreciate that uh, she's taken the time to come and do our talk. I hope you enjoy it and uh, have lots of questions. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you for uh, allowing me to have the show here. I'm, you know, it's a. Uh, I brought my computer up. Oh, back in December maybe, and showed her some slides, and we walked around, and I wasn't sure whether she was going to say yes, but she did, and I'm very grateful. I got really a beautiful section up there on the fifth floor. It has a nice arc, and all the paintings kind of talk to each other, and a nice spread. Thank you all for coming. Um, appreciate it very much uh, on, the, on a Friday morning getting here. So in putting this together, an artist talk, um, I told Marianne that I'd been thinking about um, uh, actually taking pictures of my work as I go along, sort of, uh, I get stuck a lot. I'm an abstract painter and I get stuck. So one of the ways I help myself move along is to take a picture of where I'm stuck and go away for a little while, leave my painting. And sometimes I look at it on my uh, cell phone or on the computer and think about it or I'll sleep on it. I wake up in the morning and I spend half an hour thinking about the painting. And sometimes there's an answer and sometimes it's just no answer, I just go back to the painting. But I have been keeping a record of the stages of the painting. So that's kind of what I'm presenting to you today. Um, the word archaeology is uh, maybe not the right term, but it's what I'm trying to say is that there are layers and layers and layers in my paintings. And the layers themselves lead me to the next one. So sometimes I see something underneath that teaches me where to go or leads me to the next thing. So I've used the terms the bones, the underpinning of the painting, and the skin is what you end up seeing but it's what's beneath the skin, I think, is also um, almost as interesting to me. So um, the other thing to say is that uh, I did a quick edit right before I started the presentation today because I, I didn't have the correct program. So you'll see some text that's not as pretty and nice and tidy as I would have made it. Okay. So this was actually going to be embedded, and you weren't even going to see it, and I was going to talk to you. But I'll read it with you instead. So abstraction, which is what I do, allows one to see with her mind, and I changed the word he to her, um, this is a quote by Ashiel Gorky, um, abstraction allows one to see with her mind that she cannot physically see with her eyes. Abstract art enables the artist to perceive beyond the tangible, to extract the infinite out of the finite. It is the emancipation of the mind. It is an explosion into unknown areas. So Ashil Gorky um, was an abstract artist as well. Oops, oopsie, let me get you there. Um, Goethe, and in trying to prepare how I was going to arrange uh, my thinking around this, I'm a colorist largely, I would say, abstract work. Um, Goethe, um, who lived in the 1800s, um, was, he came after Isaac New Sir Isaac Newton, who um, invented or sort of discovered that the prison breaks into color. This is a, a prism I have in my house that shatters, scatters light all over and walk through the house. It catches on your clothes or in your hair on the floor. I put my palm up and it came into my palm. And I wanted to um, kind of dig a little into what, is, what I'm looking at. What am I dealing with with color? Goethe's thinking about color is that color um, is magnified or is, is truer when it's next to another color. So yellow next to a purple is going to be different than yellow next to a blue. Um, and then his also, he says, where they overlap is where the pure color comes. So it's different than what Newton was doing, which is the fragmentation into the seven colors. Um, and here, here are my notes that I was going to secretly read to you. Um, so Goethe uh, was born, uh, he was a, uh, in 1749 to 1832, he was a poet, 
a playwright, and a diplomat philosopher. Color exists in relation to other colors. It arises at the edges and the spectrum occurs where the colored edges overlap. And this is where he's a little different, this next um, section here. Color is felt emotionally and vis viscerally as well as intuitively, whereas Isaac Newton was a scientist and he, was, he talked about it as a, um, as a spectrum, as a scientific breakdown. So Goethe is talking about the gut and the head. So how do, you, how do you think about it and how do you feel about it? Sort of more intuitive. Um, and it's interesting as a, as a um, poet, playwright, philosopher that he was really interested in the arts and he was digging deeper into what he was looking at and trying to understand why he was moved by a certain color over another. It's the phenomenon of how we perceive color and the psychological effect of color versus what Newton came up with in 1740, his analytical measurable study. So this is my little, this is my little quote of, if you ask me what my work is about, uh, my understanding is abstract art is an intuitive, philosophical, psychological, and analytical process with or without words. It's very hard to talk about the work, so I'm trying to give the framework of what other people um, understand about color and then hang my, my, my work on that. If you have any questions, please interrupt me. I, gallop along here. This is a painting that's upstairs and it's called Janus Series 2. Um, when I I'm going to present three paintings and their underpinnings, the, the archaeology of three paintings. And Janus uh, is the first one. This is the final version. This is not one of the in, uh, beginning ones. So this is the final version of Janus. And this is where, um, uh, next one you will see where it begins. So as we look at these archaeologies, um, the elements of art and principles of design. That's what EOA and POD, um, I taught high school for a long time and I used to use, just use those little punch lines. And I, a texture, line, shape, color, value, um, the edge between and the territory and calm, movement, rhythm, unity, space. Ma is a Japanese word for gap or pause or space, and mu is the no thingness, nothingness. And those are concepts I, some of these I deal with a lot more in my work than others. Um, emphasis, variety, contrast. So those are kind of your elements of art principles of design. Any painting that you look at, you could say that one's got a lot of texture, or that one's dealing with the colors and their balance between here and there, and their the emphasis is on this. So in teaching um, students to look at paintings, I would often have them go through and tell me where they, what they saw in the painting, which one, which one had the heavier in influence on it. So an example here is that color is an affective, an interior experience. Um, and again, these, were, these are my notes, so they're, if they're messy up here, please try to excuse my little shorthand. Um, for example, blue is the symbol of intellect or the sky. There's a great book I used to use all the time. It's called The Secret Language of Symbols, and it's got a great section on color. Um, so if students were doing symbolism in their work, I would say, okay, well, what color do you want to express what you're feeling? So they would go through, so for example, um, blue is the color of intellect or sky and coolness, but also the Greeks believed that blue, um, it was the color of Venus and therefore the goddess of love. So blue in different cultures would have different meanings. Yellow, by culture, the West, yellow represents disease. In quarantine, a yellow flag would represent that. But in Buddhist culture, um, it's the color of humility and therefore the saffron-colored robes. This is the beginning of this, okay? So that ended up, but this is where it began. This was an old canvas I had in the studio and I didn't like the painting anymore. I had a lot of fun with it, making this painting, and I liked, you know, it was around and it was a finished painting for a while. But the reason I felt it wasn't, um, there's a better picture, this is very faint. Um, it, I painted the whole thing black, um, and then I took pieces of newspaper, and for an experiment, I rolled them with acrylics, and I laid them on, and I was dealing with greens shifting, and the color shifts. And then over that, I took another layer of newspaper, and I laid it on with uh, the deep purples, and they overlap to change the color. And then I printed with a piece of metal that I rolled with uh, gold and pressed those on. So it was a, an experiment. It was interesting. I called it the, 
I called it the Four Seasons and the Cycles of the Moon, which is probably one of the most literal titles I ever have. So you have the, the Cycles of the Moon, the 12 panels. Um, and I didn't plan any of it. It was just the way, the, the size of the paper that I was measured out, and it, it's how it came. I think there's also some bubble wrap that I rolled up there above the circles. So it was, it was a fun experiment, but I didn't want to keep it. So as a detail of that, I kind of liked that section. And I look carefully before I cover up my paintings, but this one really does disappear. Um, one of the, I meant to bring this up, one of my favorite tools, aside from a palette knife, is using a, a scraper or card. And I just take these and sometimes I cut them, but I, I love to dip the paint and and it's a whole physical beginning. So this began with um, that one color uh, that I laid over, began laying over. And as I do that, almost every single painting, I begin this way with these sweeps. And it's a very physical gesture. But you can see that there are gaps, places that aren't heavily covered or places that I miss. And those are the things I try to pay attention to because I think they're like signposts or tickets to get to the next place. So I was uh, hesitant to cover up um, the, all the gold circles and things. I'm uh, working with gold or copper is very seductive. So I try um, to get rid of it as much as I can. And I, I think I covered up most of it. But then I, had, I went ahead and took it out. <coughs> so what appears instead are these rectangles that became, instead of the circles, I guess they were still part of the larger painting where there were the, the squares that were marking around the edges. Um, and I, you can see here my strokes have changed a lot. I, I don't use brush very often, but I was at a, sorry, I was <laughs> moving this thing. Um, I started using a brush and got very tight. And this is often what happens. I go from the big gestural, the sweeping, and then get lost, which is okay. Um, and then pick up a brush and try to find somewhere, where am I going now? And so in doing this, the middle section became um, a really important. I think that one stays throughout to the end. <coughs> I've now turned it upside down. So here you are with that rectangle at the top and the rectangle's now down below. And I've gone back to using the palette knife now. And you can see the sweep and the gestures. Yeah. Scale. I mean, I'm picturing this is very big, like mm -hmm. larger than you. Is it? It is. Um, this one is 36 by 36. Here, here, yeah. So there is that gestural piece, but not as big as the 72, which is, you know, a full day's work of just getting it covered. <coughs> Thanks. For that. That's a good question. Um, the other thing that's happening here is I'm making color choices. So not only am I trying to find out where I'm going, I'm seeing bands developing. So now I've got you know, the yellow, the purple, the blue, and yet they're mixing up. I'm bringing blue up to the top. I'm bringing the yellow down a little bit below. And that rectangle, the two rectangles are still pretty prominent there. Okay, so we've gone from here where I like that. And on the one hand, I think that could have been done, but it wasn't enough. So I went to this, which was terribly stilted, but um, I, I had to bring it in. I had to, had to bring in some kind of organization very tight, but I, what I liked about it was that I, it, they felt um, it was suddenly connected back to another series I had done called the Letter Series. And the, every single painting, this is when these were more figurative works, had some sort of letter or an edge of a piece of paper in it. So these became um, some kind of message. And I just followed that. I began to highlight the outside of it so that they came forward. And again, that little, you can still see a little bit of the original up at the top, the copper at the top, and the little rectangle that's embedded in the, the larger rectangle there. Um, these are usually two months, six weeks to two months. So yeah. maybe not every day you go uh, do every, something and walk away? Uh, every day, every day. Um, two to four hours, sometimes six if I'm lucky. But sometimes I have two, two paintings going at once, which is very helpful to step away from one and go to the other and try not to have them talk back and forth. Um, that one's now gone upside down. So here, I flipped it upside down. And I've brought some color into the, those two panels at the top. And beginning to bring the color down into this lower rectangle. I think I've also begun, I really began to love this green down here, which was green over black. And the greens are actually made not with green, because I 
I don't like green as a, as a tube color, but I make it from a couple ways. Uh, yellow and, and black make a beautiful green. Those are Payne's gray and yellow. And the other green that I love is a, I was working with this yesterday, blue and orange make a beautiful green. And you'd think it would make a brown, but it, depending on the colors that you use, a, a phthalo blue mixed with an orange will make a lovely green. Okay. Then we go into this softening. Okay, so the middle section where there's this vibrant yellow, the upper panel is still there, that little embedded rectangle is still there, but the outsides start becoming active. They've, they've gone from this, which was that cold green, which I really liked, I got rid of it and softened it here. And I kind of wish this, I had kept this one, I like this one a lot, um, but I learned from that. So well, that's part of the reason of taking the pictures, I can go back and see where I've been and what is there, is there something in there that I can use or don't like. Um, both of them are messages. This got tight again. All that lovely softness disappeared. I started tightening it up with the turquoise and the teal. And very, very tight here. The middle, the middle column is kind of an interesting thing to watch, this middle kind of road. And I think I told Marianne this. Hi, welcome. Um, when we were talking about this particular painting, that the middle band came in uh, when I was very stuck and I had, we were coming back, I think from Dartmouth, going back down to Putney and the light was hitting the road and there was this, that was it. That was what I brought into the painting, the way the light was hitting the road. And it, it's very literal to say that because it's, it, does, it can look like a road if I say that, but it's, it's not a road. It's, it's just there as, as a piece of how this painting came together. So here it was very tight and I think I was thinking of actually, oh, that landscape I saw that day and how do I, do I want to bring that in? I didn't want to bring it in. Usually if, I, if it begins to look like something, I'll turn it around, I'll turn it quarter or upside down just so that I, I don't get um, seduced by what I think it should be. I want it to kind of tell me what to be. Okay, so here to here, I brought in the triangle. I blocked out that road although it's still embedded in the lower section there. And another kind of interesting thing, can I do this, Andy? Can I carry this? Okay. Um, this triangle piece, so there's a whole, this actually became a really important, they're like structures, kind of supports for that triangle. But they stay, for some reason, those didn't get integrated into the larger triangle. This point is just most, I would call this cover up. This is cover up section, um, just going through with the, with the scraper again using this scraping on the paint. And all that other stuff that you know is under there is, is bumpy and it's crusty and it's textured. So as I scrape with this, it's no longer going on smooth, it's going on skimming on the top, which is a technique called scumbling. And it catches on things and doesn't go into all the grooves. It's just out, I love to paint outside. So in the summer I can do that. I, this is out on the porch of my little studio. Um, Again, I didn't know where all of that scraping was going, so I started to bring in black, and I really love that diagonal line. It kind of reminded me of the road going crooked for some reason, but again, that was, that was too much. So I got rid of it, and I brought back the rectangle that had been there all along, and calmed, I calmed down the bottom part, but this was boring. I like you know, the organization, but there was no life in this, even though I knew all the active stuff that had gone under it. And you can really see, I think, also, the other thing at this point, because I was frustrated with it being so quiet, I took um, a gel, which I mix most of my paints with a gel, and I just put straight gel on, and there's all of this texture, and I used a comb, just scraped it on, covered the whole thing with this clear gel, which kind of goes on milky. It's a little scary because it makes everything look like milk, and then it dries and it's clear. So I've got all this wonderful new texture to deal with, and I, I hoped that it was going to give me something new and exciting. And it did come to this. This is the second to last stage. Um, the upper kind of what I call um, unconscious writing. I will take my left hand and a, and a big brush and just jam it along. I've done this in a couple of paintings and I, I end up liking it, but this was too def definitive. It looked like too much like a, a writing or something. Somebody's supposed to read something in that. Um, and there was still un the diffuse color in there. It didn't feel felt like too, too unorganized still, and then it came to this. So that I had gone back to the top, and I had blocked out a lot of that writing, and 
um, brought the purple up into the blue. You can still see that same rectangle. Um, and I put that in there to, to kind of uh, be a salve for your eyes so I can get you ready for the next picture, the next series. Um, this is, I'm just going to take you on a little short, um, some of my influences. Uh, I had, I think, about eight or nine in here. I'm only going to talk about three quick influences. Uh, Richard Diebenkorn, um, he was uh, the California abstract school. And he, what I like about him is that he went back and forth between figurative and abstract. Um, and he wanted to, to not really try anything new. He wanted to rely on the old masters and then find his own, his own way based on the old masters. So he wasn't trying to, he was at the same time as Jackson Pollock and um, Motherwell, and he, he did his own thing. He was uh, an excellent teacher. He taught for years at, at um, the California State System, and he was known as a teacher as much as he was as uh, um, an artist. So abstract expressionism. And he says, all paintings start out of a mood and out of a relationship with things or people and out of complete visual impression, which is a, if you have to say where a painting comes from, that's a nice beginning to say. Um, he has, this is a quick little thing, notes to myself but from Deben Korn. I think uh, number three in particular, he says, do search, but in order to find other than what is searched for which I thought, that he must have been, I mean, I, I could have said that. <laughs> no, he said it first, but I, I found this as I was putting this together. I thought that was really very useful. Um, number seven, mistakes can't be erased, but they move you from your present position, which is another useful one. This is a nice little thing. You can find it on the Internet if you want to go back, and I don't want to spend too much time reading it to you. Um, the last one, be careful only in a perverse way. So... Be ready to let go, I guess, is what he's saying. And tolerate chaos, those two things. I keep thinking about Pollyanna and that. Oh, <laughs> 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 I know. I don't it's just, it's like, uh, yeah. Keeps me yeah, I know. I, I skipped that one because I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. But I, I'm sure if I read more about him, I'm, I have always liked his work. And, uh, but that one I didn't quite get. Pat Steer. Um, this is actually a picture in a gallery, so you can get the sense of the size. Her pieces are about as tall as that wall there. Um, she's known as a drip artist. Um, she uh, went to Pratt School of Art, New York. Uh, her pieces are so powerful standing in front of them. She takes cans of paint and just pitches them up on the wall, or she'll climb up on ladders and pour and pour and then spray them so they run more, and she'll scrape them out and spray them again. Um, so she, she got her, she not got her ideas from, but she was very influenced by John Cage, who you all probably know as the musician who um, used silence as his music. And he got up on stage and sat um, and didn't play anything, but I can't remember what it's called, Seven Minutes. And it's, he sat on stage and he got booed off, but I think he made a statement. Um, so her, the role of chance and separation of ego is what Pat Steer's work. Agnes Martin, uh, she's another fabulous, a uh, very uh, austere artist who would draw little tiny lines, and tiny lines, but she was good friends with um, Agnes Martin, so they put the artist spirit in the art object is what um, she got from Agnes Martin. The artist explained, I wanted to destroy images as symbols, to make the image of a symbol for a symbol. I had to act it out, make the image and cross it out. No imagery, but at the same time, endless imagery. Every nuance of paint texture worked as an image. So that, you, sort of going back to that first uh, example that I was showing in my work, that a little piece of something will lead you to the next thing. A little, little snip will take you um, in, sometimes into a whole new painting. Every nuance. Mark Rothko is the third one, just to briefly touch on. Um, he was definitely an anti-establishment. Uh, did not like, uh, he went to Yale, he was Russian. Uh, he didn't stay at Yale. He didn't like the way um, he was being taught. And his, his work, his things are also very large. Um, he was Russian, uh, and I, I went to the site, Sotheby's site, and there were 21 facts about Mark Rothko. If you want to know more about him, this was a nice condensed version. He described his method as unknown adventures in unknown space, free from direct association with any particular and the passion of organism. And according to Rothko, color expresses basic human emotions, tragedy, 
ecstasy doom. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. And if you, as you say, are moved only by their re color relationships, then you miss the point. So it's something bigger than what you're looking at. It's what you, how you are affected by what you're seeing. Um, there's a, he has, there, some of his pieces are in a Rothko chapel. We saw them one time in the Tate Museum in London and they were in a kind of arc room sitting down in front of them. There were people who were weeping in front of them. And I don't know whether they were weeping for what reason, but it was a very powerful experience. And you almost, every, there's a wonderful, the closest one I can find, maybe at the Hood, I haven't been, I bet they have one at the Hood. At, um, at the RISD Museum, there's some beautiful ones down there. And it's the same experience. You walk into a room and it's just this presence. So, um, and the last quote there, the most interesting painting is one that expresses more of what one thinks than of what one sees. So here's my next, my second one I want to walk you through. This is the end painting. And I hope this is done. I have it up on the wall. Uh, Chard and I put it, we put them up and we look at them, we talk about them and <laughs> wonder if they're done. And this one, I, I, I'm very tempted to go in and do something more to it, but I'm going to leave it for now. You can see, again, the heavy texture. Um, so it's called Frequencies. I think I sent this to my son, who's, both our kids are artists. Um, I sent this to our son in Portland, and I said, what do you think? And I had called it Fire in the Heart. And he said, I love the frequencies. I said, that's it. And that was the right title. So I, took, I borrowed it from him and thank him for the title. Um, this is how it began. Again, starting out, the color. Scrape, heavy scrapes. The orange was the first color. And it, I think this is maybe the second stage of it, but it was mostly heavy, heavy orange. But where the, where the edge of the card ended, I left it. And you can see those sweeps in there. And then went in with the, began with a palette knife. This is a heavy palette knife. Same orientation, top to south, north to south, I guess I'd say. And it got, started getting very fractured right away. And this is one of my, I wouldn't say problems, but one of my tendencies, I go from this wonderful, well, I love the beginning of the painting, the excitement and the gesture. And then I start organizing it and I get tight. And, and so this is, this is a, I would say a small palette knife. I have a one that's about three times as wide and longer. And that's, it's, it's a, probably a better one. I should probably leave that one till much later. But I like the, the texture on that. Um, I've turned this to the side, so here it was. And one thing that might orient you, or helps me when I'm looking at these, this little piece right here stays for a long time. So if you kind of watch that, you'll know which direction the, the painting is moving. Um, let me just see, I'm not doing what that is. Uh, okay, so the, that piece has now moved down to the bottom and I've begun to block out a lot of the orange. I also added in this, because there was heavy, heavy weight of color, heavy darkness at the bottom, I went in with yellow, and I laid this yellow band in, which was too dominant, so I went in with the card and broke it up, started breaking it up. Gray is a beautiful color because you can make it from anything, and it can be warm, it can be cool, it can be almost black, pure black, but so this is a warm gray that I started working in there, which had a tiny bit of yellow in it, <clears throat> and then another bit with blue. Um, so that piece is back up here, rotated back up. Um, most of the orange is going away. And what's also appeared is that little squiggle in the middle. That becomes an um, important part. One of the things I was wrestling with here was, um, is it yellow I'm looking at or am I looking at the blue? Which one is talking? Um, they began pushing backwards and forwards here. And I wanted them, I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what, I, I thought I wanted to hold on to the orange as the, as the dominant piece. But it, what there, in the end, the orange was too unified. It was, there wasn't enough variety in the patches of color that I was finding there. Turn it to its side now. Um, there's that little, I call it the, the three fingers up there, up in the upper right, upper left. Um, this became, started going way too symbolic, making gestural symbols, and I did it by, I think I laid in a brushwork kind of gestural, sort of like the words, <clears throat> the unconscious writing, but they were becoming, they looked like to someone, if I looked at one piece here, I was asking myself, well, that looks like a symbol, what is it, what is it? And I didn't want anything to speak that loudly, so that became a problem. 
I also decided that I needed to divide the painting, so I, for some reason, made it into three bands. Um, most of the orange has become organized now. I went to the far left band and began laying in a green with the intention that I was going to bring gold in there so that the middle panel was going to lift forward and there was going to be gold behind it. And on this side, I wasn't going to do that. I, didn't, I think I was just going to go dark. But I got rid of all the divisions instead. Um, it became, you see the squiggle is still there. Yeah, this, I love the squiggle. I also loved, and you can, all the layers that have been building up here, you can you know, see the, is this little ghost of a color that stays resting around a lot of the, the original marks. The other piece that was interesting was this kind of, um, spear. I guess I would call that a kind of spear. And that's where it ended. So that's where it was. And so you can see that soft blue-gray that's over there. And what I did was go back to this. And that was done by laying a veil of that soft yellow over everything in the middle and looking for how they would unify. And pieces were lifting forward. And there's some there's almost kind of like a river feeling or a frequency, I guess, this, this middle panel that began, came in there. And all of that activity from underneath is still visible. It's, to me, that's, it's still all there. I can look at the, the raised edges here. I can look up here and still see the marks from all of that activity underneath. So that's number two. So <laughs> yeah. How many layers would that be, approximately? Um, I had two dozen, maybe, you know, really thick, thick layers, yes. And you can see them on the paintings, you know, they're very, like if you were chipped away, you would find that much underneath. Yeah, it's a lot of decision, or no decision. I'm trying to let not make decisions, but it, it's a very intuitive process of finding, um, when I cover up something, what is, where am I going by what's left? Um, how can I use that? I do, and actually when I was going to be playing, I forgot to turn on my, yes, I do. Um, but it, it depends. Like yesterday I was listening to a podcast instead, and that was, um, I don't, I, I think it was helpful, because I was not, I was in another difficult place in a painting, and I just painted, and I made great progress. But other times I usually listen to anything from opera um, to jazz. Uh, try not to listen to too much with words. Yeah, I don't understand the foreign opera enough to, but I love the feeling of it, yeah. <clears throat> Rooms of the Heart, um, and this one I think was for, is upstairs, and it was uh, first called Five Rivers. Chart, I may change it to Rooms of the Heart, so I did. Um, I run titles by chart a lot. Uh, so this one <clears throat> was just one painting. It, I really just started with one, and I didn't know I needed another one, so it's, it's, thir it's uh, 30 across 60. It was 30 by 60. But the second panel didn't come for a long time. And then it had to catch up with texture to the other one. So I'll kind of walk you through that. Um, this one is unusual. <coughs> I think I just told you that. I came to the title first from a concept I was reading about in Thich Nhat Hanh's book, um, Five, R Five Rivers, which became Room of Rooms of the Heart. So this is how it began. And I laid in the orange first. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah, the orange first, uh, actually more of a red, the red first, and then I did a veil of blue, which turns it purple. So the red stayed, I got a purple out of it, and the, um, I didn't go for any particular blue. Um, <coughs> and I got uh, sort of seduced early on by the gold again and the copper, and I brought that in to kind of organize those empty spaces. So back here, Let's see which orientation we're at. It goes upside down, I think, yep. Yeah. So I, start, I started filling in. It was almost like, okay, those are the gaps, and I'm going to organize those. But what I, I made, the, I don't, wouldn't say I made the mistake of, but what I did was make them very angular and sort of geometric. And I'm not sure why, because it then dominated my, all my decisions. Um, so back to the five rivers, um, the concept I was dealing with was uh, the body, the sensations we have in the body, uh, how we view our perceptions, 
how we mental formations in a sense um, judge. I don't know if that's the right term. Um, and the consciousness, our overall understanding of what's going on. So those are, I sometimes bring a concept to, to it, but I don't say that this equals this. That's just what was going on in this particular painting. Um, began kind of cal calming down all the gold here. And one of the things, I'll just back it up just a second there. Um, there's a little hook over on the left-hand side in the, in the middle of the copper. And I think that then ends up over here, and I made this kind of horseshoe, which uh, the color is very, very bright. It really isn't this bright. <laughs> I'm not sure. That on the screen, it looks nice and normal. Um, so that became very dominant, and I decided not to keep it there. I moved it down to the bottom, and I took off the top of it. So it became just bands that were going there. I was very lost at this point. I didn't know where I was going with it at all. So I added another canvas. So I've done this in the past, that first picture that was up, which was three panels. Um, so right where the two join, there are some marks that connect one to the other. So the panel on the left is the one that I've been working on, and most of the gold is gone from that. You can see the, the panels, the, uh, that little window down here. That was the one that I had been working with. And so that's sitting at the bottom, and this next one is brought in. So the five rivers, this, this actually had the five rivers in my mind, one, two, and then that negative space in the middle, three, four, five. Um, there were sections that I started falling in love with, and I usually tell myself if I fall in love with something, I need to cover it up because it's going to teach me something, which I try to try to pay attention to that. I don't always cover it up, but what I, I loved this, this three circles that were happening up here, and I loved that red and black. But then the red and black disappear. I've now turned it right uh, so it's vertical. The bottom one is the new panel, and the top is the, the older one. And I put a big circle in there, which disappears mostly, but it still has the essence of being there. And it's now called um, Rooms of the Heart instead of the Five Rivers. Um, still, the, the conversation is happening between the reds that are echoed throughout in the middle, up on the upper side, on the top and bottom, on the, on the right and the bottom, and then the blues that unify it. These are a few more. Um, to show you these quickly, this is another one that's up there. I'm not, this, I'm not don't have the archaeology of this one. This is just one that's up there. And it's called Portal, um, where I did successfully, I think, keep the coppers and golds um, without destroying them too much. And that's actually gold leaf that I laid in on the top. Um, I also like that it's off-center rather than totally organized. I have a tendency to want to organize and make them geometric and make them um, line up, but I'm, I'm much happier when they are off-center and not lined up and there's a gap and a space between things because I think the space holds as much energy or comment uh, to the painting as, as what's there. This is also one that's up there, First Blossom. This is a large one. I think it's um, 30, is it bigger than 36 maybe? Um, but this, this was the one I really wrestled with this. It's similar to very much to the one we looked at before, the frequency one, um, where I have these marks and how do I organize the marks. And I left, left most of the marks um, just as, a, as an indicator and covered up everything else. So there is a kind of a script, there's kind of an energy, there's kind of a um, colors talking to each other, that teal blue that's in there talks throughout and some vivid purples. But if it had all been just orange or all just pale uh, peach there, um, it would have been a more of a boring painting, I think. Uh, I think there's a lot of vitality in this one. And they'll just throw this one in just to see that I haven't always been an abstract painter. I have, um, but I think you see the same edgy quality, the same sharpness, edginess, the thick paint, the thick buildup. Um, I did a lot of blue glass. I fell in love with blue glass, and it actually was the, the what led me into abstraction because I loved the light. And I got so entranced with looking at that light that I decided I didn't need an object anymore. And I could look at light without an object. And so I, but I, I, I love the, the way the, the crustiness still comes out. You can see the layering process was still part of what I've done. This is also, um, this is the last one I'll show you. It's called Trace. 
And it's a large painting. A lot of gold is in it. And um, probably not as many layers as the ones I've showed you, but I, at least um, probably 10 layers in there. And it was, again, built by turning it and turning it and turning it. So it has its own kind of rhythm in turning. And then I'll turn it the other way until I find the answer. So that's it. Um, thank you. And I would love to hear your questions, <laughs> if you have any. Or if you want to just go up and look at the work, that's fine, too. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. How long have you been painting? Um, since I was 18. Yeah, yeah. So I've, it's always been, I was an oil painter to begin with, and for a long time. And we've um, always lived in small houses and finally realized that probably wasn't good to be oil painting in small houses with the fumes. And I know you can get um, solvents now that are not toxic, but I, I think we, I love the acrylic. I feel like I paint in the same way as I, I, oil painting taught me a lot about layers and transparencies, and I paint with acrylics in the same way. Um, they're more um, opaque, most of them, than, a, uh, than the oil paint is. Um, but I do mix them with layer with the gel mediums, and sometimes um, you can get thin gels or thick gels or, you know, sculptural level gels. But I, um, so that's the difference, I guess. That's one of the things I'm doing differently. Yeah. And you kind of answered this already, but um, have you had phases to your to your art? You said you you started out with more representational art, and then um, got fascinated by the light and, yeah. and just. I would say, yes, I have had phases, but I also s would say that they are all the same in that it's this, this tool. I mean, this is the tool that I fell in love with when I was, I, I learned that, that paint goes on so differently when you can press and you can get edge and you can scrape. You can scrape it all off also, and then you get all these wonderful colors coming up underneath. So um, that's been a, that's the common um, between them all. So I would say uh, when I was learning, uh, it was, um, Landscape, uh, still life, portraiture, and I'll go back to all those still. I will do those. Um, but I, and landscape became, I still love when I go on, on vacations, I always bring a little watercolors and, and do, wa do landscape. So I have pictures from all the little places we've been. Sometimes even on the road, I'll be, sure I'll be driving and I'll be, you know, painting. Um, but I, and portraiture is, is scary. Um, I, always find something in, in the face that I didn't know was there, even in my own. Uh, I particularly like to draw or paint myself in the night window, so you get, you get um, a lot of the features disappear and you get an essence of a face. So I like that. Um, I was doing that the other night. Uh, so it's not just pure this. I, I, this is mostly what I do, but I, in between I will do other things. But phases, I think this has been the last 30 years. Yeah, I think I've been doing 25, 30 years this. But even this has changed. This is, has gone to different places, yeah. Anything else that confuse you at all? I'm sure <laughs> I, I did. I'm wondering, so it would be interesting because you say that sometimes you'll take a picture and it will be there and then all of a sudden you say, oh, no, yeah. we're going to change it all. So yeah. somebody could buy a painting and then 15 years come back to you and say, I'm going to leave this for you. Mm. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah, touch it. You would you <laughs> would I would. I would honor their choice to have gotten that. I guess because they must have found something in it. I would assume if they had decided they wanted it. I, I try not to go. If I, I didn't hadn't shown that one that I showed you that I really covered up. I hadn't shown that anywhere. And I think sometimes when you get to the showing stage, then you've said, "It's done. It's done." This is a, this is a little a catalog that I had from a show. Um, 2000, I guess it went from September to March, so it ended last March. But um, the pictures that are in here are, oh, I know, I, there is one more I wanted to show you. The picture, uh, um, they, are, they are done, I guess I would say. These are done. And, and I, look, I go back to them and I look at them again. Like this little, this is a fairly small one. And I, I have it in the living room and I look at that and I say, I really like that piece. But I didn't at lo for a long time. I really like it now. So, um, but there's, there's one more in here, and it's this one. Return is Ticket, which is a 48 by 48. And it was uh, what this show was called, Return is Ticket. And it was based on a poem um, that Chard wrote. And it was, and I wanted to I include this um, <coughs> because it was one of the few where I 
I had, I had that come up with a, they needed a, the gallery needed a big piece for the window. And so um, I chose uh, this title in order to, that was the title of the show, but I had, didn't have a painting for it. So then they asked for the painting and I had to make the painting. So I, it was a really different way for me to, okay, I've got to use the idea of return as ticket and make a painting. And the, this one went through its same many, many stages, but um, it was about somebody driving, the poem is about someone driving away and forgetting their wallet and coming back. And in coming back, everything has changed. The landscape's the same, but it's different because you're coming back at a different time, your headset's in a different place. So um, I don't know, do you want me to read this to you? I really want to read it. <laughs> this is called Return is Ticket by Chard Denord. <clears throat> When I'm forced to return home to retrieve something I've forgotten, I enter a double zone that's the same road I just went down, but am returning on now with an altered vision of its sameness that turns it into another road, which is so different. I hardly know what to call it as I speed forward in heading back, taking in everything that's so familiar, the fence posts, pasture, elms, and burdock, as suddenly strange through the lens of inconvenience. It's almost a dream, but not really, more a consequence of accepting my mistake, which allows me in turn to see, if even briefly, so many things I've hidden, as if my mind needed to forget to save my heart from the haste that governs my life. Something shines in the distance. I call it the lamp of internal difference that needs the spark of my seeing anew to light its mantle. Then everything I see I know was once forgotten and lay in the dark behind the light. I hear the cries of them all as parts of the whole, in the suff of wheels, in the absence of the single thing that I've forgotten, and then the loss of those I can't redeem. They are songs as well that quiet the hum of a powerful engine and slap of tires on wet macadam. I notice too that the cobalt sky has now become the vault for all I feel on the road of my remembering. It's my ticket for the matinee of my own showing, this turning back to fetch my wallet, this foreign film I title Late Again with Burning Captions. So that was the impetus for this. Um, and it was a difficult painting and it has, I have, um, Somebody has it in their house, which I'm really tickled by. So <laughs> I get to see it every now and then. Yeah. So what does, um, what sparks your first, you know, set of paint on the canvas? You know, what, how do you start? <laughs> there, I start differently each time, I think. Um, especially when I have finished one, it's very hard to begin the next one. And it's scary. Um, I, but I, um, I bought a bunch of canvases the other day and I prepared. So I've... I'm working on one now that I anticipate finishing. Um, made big leaps yesterday. I hope it'll come out soon. Again, it's a diptych, so I'm turning it around and moving it a lot. Um, but getting the, I have three new wooden panels. So that, that very first one um, I showed you, I'll take you back to that, uh, is three panels that are 18 by 18. So when they set up, they're 48 by 18. And I don't know if I'm just gonna start out with one because this one began with just the center one. I only had one panel, and I was, I, was, I was playing. So how do I start? I start out by playing sometimes. This one I challenged myself, to, I'm gonna take every color that's on my desk and I'm gonna throw it on that middle. And I, it made this, this kind of pinwheel of color. And it was um, okay, but it was um, boring in a sense. So again, I went to the edges, and this was the second one. This whole thing was upside down, if you can imagine. That was upside down. So this one was over there, and I was having a great time with it. Layers and layers were coming out, and the blues were picking up on the sides. And, and so I had, if you can cut off that one on the left, I had those two, but it felt like it was, it was incomplete, so I added a third panel. So I think, you know, I could have maybe added more, but this felt finished. So I begin by, I guess, not knowing. I try not to know where I'm going. I don't draw out ahead of time. <clears throat> but I might have seen a color, or I might have seen the way the light is coming. Um, and those aren't really conscious things, but I, walking in the woods is a wonderful thing, and reading, I do a lot of reading and listening to music. Um, they're all kind of impetus, impeti, impetuses for um, beginning. Um, so yeah, 
a good question, though. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm happy to walk you upstairs and look at them with you if you'd like and look at things a little. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.